On this edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at Just Worry About Today. You only need to be concerned or worry about one day, and that's today. And I know for me, when I, when I kind of you know, discovered this, this, this reality, for me, it, it, was, it was kind of like I found myself saying to the Lord, Lord, that sounds too good to be true. So this little saying we hear in uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, in many ways it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, like here are these people, they're prophesying in the Lord's name, they're driving out demons in the Lord's name, they're they're working mighty deeds, mighty wonders uh, in, in the Lord's name, and yet the Lord says to them, I don't know you. And you think to yourself, like, how can that be, you know? How can it be um, uh, that someone who is doing such spiritual things, such good things, cannot be united with the Lord, cannot be in a, in a relationship with the Lord? And um, I guess the answer is, and again, I don't, I don't fully understand this, and not, not that I need to understand everything, but they say that charisms or spiritual gifts are not a sure sign of holiness. A person can have remarkable spiritual gifts or charisms, but that's not a sure sign of holiness. And that's why, for example, in the canonization of saints, you know, the church likes to canonize saints, uh, when the church is investigating to determine, was this person, did this person really live a saintly life? Was this person really holy? Whether or not the person had remarkable charisms really isn't a factor in whether or not to canonize a person. Because the church recognizes that you can have people, and there have been people with remarkable spiritual gifts who weren't holy, who said, Lord, Lord, but were not doing the will of God in their life. Now, again, this is mysterious to me. I don't understand it. One of the things they do say is that when the Lord gives gifts, He never takes them back. He's not that type of giver, you know. When the Lord gives a person a gift, if we start messing up, He's not going to take it back from us. So if he gives someone the gift of, you know, being able to do exorcisms, to be able to cast out demons, and the person begins to exercise that gift, uh, but doesn't kind of abide in the Lord, doesn't live in a relationship with the Lord, the Lord, for some mysterious reason, won't take the gift away. He'll allow the person to continue to exercise the gift. Um, now again, this to me, uh, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but when the Lord came up with this idea, He never consulted me, which is fine, you know. I'm sure He's got a lot more wisdom th- than me. Um, but what the church is looking for when they canonize, when they're, when they're considering canonizing someone, is they're looking to see, did this person have the fruits of the Spirit in her life? Was this person a virtuous person? person. Now, the fruits of the Spirit, Paul lists them in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. In the catechism, they list 12. Paul lists nine in this particular list, but there's other places in the Scripture that they speak about gifts of the Spirit. And so, these are signs of holiness. These are sure signs of holiness. If someone has these, these fruits of the Spirit in their life, and again, also the virtues, if the person is, is a virtuous person, especially the theological virtues, faith, hope, and uh, charity. Um, and so again, it's, it's, it's a mysterious thing, and the truth is, is that it's a lot more work coming to a place where your life has the fruits of the Spirit than to simply receive a gift and exercise a gift. Now again, the Lord, He wants to give us gifts. And if we, if we are faithful to the Lord and if we use these gifts well, they can be a means for us to grow in holiness and certainly a means for others to grow in holiness. But again, they're not a sure sign of holiness. You know, true, true holiness requires that, that foundational work. Jesus goes on to speak about. You know, Jesus gives basic principles about how to build a house. 
Now, some of you might know I've got a little cabin in the woods. Did you know that? Years ago, I bought a little property in, deep in the bush along a little river. And I decided I'd like to build a little cabin along, like on my property along the river. And when I built this cabin, I took a week off, and my brother and my dad, they joined me. When we built this cabin, we did not follow any biblical principles, okay? We built the cabin on sand. And not only that, we built it on a floodplain. Can you imagine? <laughs> you know, it, but, but it's the type of thing, it's a very small cabin, 12 by 12, smaller than most of your sheds, okay? So I didn't care. Like I said, if it floats down the river, it floats down the river, you know? I'll build another one. But the, but the point is, is that it's a lot easier to just quickly build a cabin on sand. The other option is to dig down, I don't know what, seven, eight, nine feet to the, to the bedrock. You dig down to the bedrock, that's what most people do, dig down to the bedrock, put you know, little cement pylons or whatever, and then build on the rock foundation, build up, and then if there is a flood, if the, if the river comes you know, sweeping down uh, and the, the cabin's well built, it'll stay there, you know? That's basic wisdom. But the thing is, my reasoning when I was building the cabin is it's just going to take more work to build a foundation like that than it'll take to build the whole cabin, and I only have a week off, you know? <laughs> the other thing when we built the cabin, we didn't have any plans, you know? We all kind of know how to build stuff. We just got a bunch of two-by-fours and other materials, plywood and all. We just built it, you know? It was a lot of fun, one of the best weeks of my life. Um, but again, not at all built on biblical principles. No, I don't care because it's just a little cabin. Again, if it gets, if it, if it gets, uh, f if it flows down the river, if it gets, you know, caught up in a flood and goes down the river, it's not the end of the world. The only thing I'd be regret is that we have a nice wood stove in the cabin, you know. My brother paid $500 for it, and so that'd be, it'd be sad to see the wood stove goes. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is, the point is, is it's, it's a lot of work to build our life on a rock-solid foundation, and most of us, including myself, we all, we all prefer the easy path. You know, I mean, it's the, cl the classic example is, you know, you see all these billboards, you know, lose 30 pounds in 30 days, you know. I don't know how you're going to lose 30 pounds in 30 days, but it's not going to last. If you want to be, you know, whatever, slim and trim or whatever, the ideal is to become the type of person who likes to live a healthy life the type of person who actually likes to exercise and likes to eat healthy food and all that kind of thing. And that takes time, apparently, you know. You know, it's really important to ask ourselves, what's, what's, what's your view of life? What do you see life as? Do you see life as, as a time that is meant to, for, for us to be pampered? Or do we see life kind of as ourselves, like a chick in the egg? They say, and I've never done this before, I'd never do such a thing, but they say if you, t if you had an egg and there was a little chick inside and the, the, the egg was about to hatch, and if you were to, to, to help the chick and to gently remove the shell of the egg, they say that chick would die. And the reason it would die is when, when it would get out of these, sh you know, when you would t let it get out of the shell because you, you, you'd save them all the work, um, it wouldn't have the strength to carry itself, to walk around, to get food, to, to find safety in its mother and all that, because they say that the last part of a chick's development of her bones and muscles is the struggle, the pushing, the, you know, the kind of breaking out of the shell, and it takes time, and they push, and they crack, and, and eventually when they get out, they're strong. And so too in this life, there's a mystery of the reality that we need to struggle in this life. No one likes to struggle in this life, but the truth is, is the struggle is good. In some mysterious way, the struggle is good, and the Lord calls us to see that. You know, remember the Lord Jesus saying, um, you know, uh, hard is the road to lead, that leads to life, and few take it, you know? And, and, um, and so anyways, life, life is a struggle, but it's a good struggle, um, and the Lord calls us to that struggle. We will continue with the teaching by Father Mark in just a moment. The Food for Life ministry is only made possible by the financial donations from you, our viewers. We ask that after the program, you prayerfully consider a tax-deductible financial donation to help us continue this Catholic television ministry. 
To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. Thank you for your prayers and support. And now back to Father Mark Goring. Now what I want to do is I want to share with you a basic biblical principle uh, tonight that has had a huge effect in my life that was kind of a, a, a turning point in my life um, dealing with how to, how to grow in virtue and how to grow in holiness because like when I had my conversion and I discovered that the Lord was calling me to holiness, to, to, to change my life, to virtue, to, to you know, the fruits of the Spirit, it seemed very overwhelming for me. And I thought to myself, like, man, I am so far off and, and you know, I have so much work ahead of me and, and especially virtue, it takes time. And, and there was kind of a feeling of um, discouragement, like this is going to take forever, you know. And also a feeling of not being content with where I was at, you know, just, just in, in the process, you know, we're all a work in progress, and I, I didn't like that, you know, I wanted to be there now, you know. But one of the scriptures that, that kind of revolutionized my worldview or my understanding of the spiritual life was uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. And I've shared this with you before, Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. Where Jesus tells us, uh, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Sufficient for a day is its own evil. Now, there's a, a nicer translation for the second sentence. The RSV says, let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. So do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. And I just finished reading the catechism for, I don't know, a second or third time. And reading the catechism, like, I knew pretty much everything that was in there. Like, I didn't really learn anything new. But the one thing that the catechism speaks about a number of times that I never noticed, and I didn't, I didn't really know much about, was the whole spirituality of today. A number of times the catechism speaks about the, the, the Lord's today. And I remember thinking, I was like, what's up with this today thing? You know, for example, in the Our Father, when we say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, they say the Lord gives us our daily bread, obviously, in the Eucharist, in the reading of Scripture, um, in something else, and I forget what it was, but also in the today. I remember thinking to myself, like, what's up with this today? And the, the, what, 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 the, the biblical reality, that the principle we see throughout Scripture in a number of places is that the Lord somehow created the universe or created the, you know, our, our, our world that our life is divided up in all these different days, you know. And the Lord himself here in Matthew 6 and in other places kind of highlights that you only need to be concerned or worry about one day, and that's today. And I know for me when I, when I kind of you know, discovered this, this, this reality, for me, it, it, was, it was kind of like, I found myself saying to the Lord, Lord, that sounds too good to be true. Like, you mean I don't need to worry about tomorrow? Like, is that allowed? Like, I thought it was my, you know, it was almost a virtue to be concerned about tomorrow. You know, oh God, you know, I, I want to, I want to, I want to, you know, get more holy, and, and, and I wish, I wish I was doing better, and I, you know, I wish, I wish things were, were, were perfect now, and all this kind of thing, and, 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 uh, you know, I just felt the Lord saying, hey, you put in a good day, and you don't need to worry about how things will work out as time goes out. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of that. And again, there was a real, a real freedom for me in that, um, and uh, anyways, uh, you'll probably be hearing more about this today thing because, again, there's a number of scriptures. The catechism talks about this, and um, it, I, I, just, I just find it, it fascinating. Again, as I was saying, um, there's, there's, there's a tendency, I think, in each one of us to honestly think that it's, it's irresponsible to not worry about tomorrow. Now again, don't get me wrong, the Lord doesn't say do not be concerned about tomorrow. Like if I, if I have uh, an exam tomorrow morning, I better study today. 
you know, I better be concerned about tomorrow. Or if, or if I'm unemployed and I'm looking for a job, to say, oh, I'm not going to worry about it, you know, I'll just take it one day at a time. Well, we, 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 should, we should be concerned. We should be doing the things today to prepare for tomorrow. But again, worrying about tomorrow is something the Lord doesn't want us to do. Now, an example of a saint who wasn't doing seemingly the great deeds, the prophesying, the casting out demons, and the miracles, was St. Joseph. A humble carpenter, a father, a husband, he got away with not saying one word in all of Scripture, and yet the most highly revered saint, honored saint in the church after the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so this is, this is kind of a reminder to us, again, that holiness can be found in simple, ordinary, day-to-day -day life. How did St. Joseph live in the heights of sanctity? How did St. Joseph live in awesome union with God? He did it by putting in a good day every day as a carpenter, as a father, and as a husband. Simple as that. Nothing extraordinary, nothing seemingly remarkable, other than the fact that he had the Son of God in his house. But even that went hidden. When Jesus began his public ministry, people say, like, who is this guy, man? Like, this is Joseph's son. This is the carpenter's son. That's how simple a life Jesus, Joseph, and Mary lived. Amazing. A lot of us don't realize, you know, just how holy, ordinary, day-to-day -day life is. And so again, this whole mystery of, 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 of today, living today in this moment, doing the best we can in this day, is indeed the path to, uh, to, 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 to sanctity. And you know, with St. Joseph too, a lot of people for some reason, they think, well, St. Joseph, Joseph's life was boring. I don't know why people assume that a husband's life or the life of a married man is a boring life. Um, but anyways, that's, that's a whole other issue. But the point is, is that People think that St. Joseph's life w was boring and dull. And again, the truth is, is that Joseph, being a just and virtuous man, would have been filled with the joy of the Lord. Would have been filled with, with great delight in his, his work, in his family life as the husband of Mary, as the, father, uh, uh, of, of the foster father of Jesus there would have been a tremendous delight in his heart and in his soul. And again, a lot of us, we don't get this. Life, reality, day-to-day -day life is meant to be a joy. It's meant to be delightful from the rising of the sun to its setting. You know, we're supposed to live our life, and again, if we're living our life virtuously, in the Spirit, intentionally, deliberately, it's supposed to be a blast, a joy, a delight, you know, and again, we don't, need to, um, we don't need to be finding these artificial thrills or whatever to be, to be deeply satisfied, deeply content, deeply joyful uh, with our day-to-day -day life. And so let's allow the Lord to give us true holiness. You know, not just the, the, the kind of um, uh, impressions of holiness or the, you know, whatever else, but to, to, to help us to live our life based on the rock-solid foundation of God's Word and His truth so that we may find His joy and our joy may be complete. You can watch this episode of Food for Life or previous episodes 24-7 anywhere around the world on YouTube just visit our website, foodforlifetvministry.org, and click on Watch Now on YouTube. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at Heart to Heart with God. We sleep better at night when we make peace with God before we go to bed. You know, you go to bed, before you go to bed, have a heart to heart with God and you will sleep so much better. Unburden yourself.
So, maybe you are someone who has given your life over to the Lord. You've made a commitment to Him. You've surrendered everything in your life. You've given Him permission. You feel like you've done it all. You've made your mistakes, but you've really tried to follow the Lord. You've really tried to be faithful. But you find yourself in this place, maybe even a dark place. And you're saying to yourself, what is going on? Can this really be in God's will? I thought that the decisions I made that have brought me to this place today were God's will. And yet, seemingly, there's a lack of peace, maybe, a lack of joy, confusion, and thinking, what, what does this all mean? And through your prayer life and everything else, you're, you're trying to stay in a place of hope. And to stay in this place of hope, we look to Jesus himself. We look at almost that scandalous scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was clearly led by the Holy Spirit to that point in time, to that great moment of destiny. And yet in the garden, we see Jesus saying, Father, is this really your will? That Jesus, even at this point, with, all, with, the, with the connection you'd have with God, that in, even in his humanity, he was saying, is this really your will? Of course, if it is, I will do it. And there was still a process for Jesus to go through, as we know. It wasn't until the actual resurrection where clarity came, right, for all of us. And so maybe you're in your garden right now, and your desire is to do God's will. That, that hasn't changed. But you're not so sure you know what it is anymore. And you're not so sure what the prospects for the future hold. And yet you know that the Lord is good. You know that the Lord is faithful. That whatever he has said is going to happen. And that there are a number of things that God has in place. There are promises that things that he wants to do, that he means to do in this life. And there may be other things that go beyond, that go beyond the grave right, that God wants to do, things he's placed in your heart. Either way, at this place that you're in right now, the focus is that God is faithful. Even if you know the place that you're in today is maybe because of some mistakes you've made, yeah, maybe you missed a couple of cues. It's like, well, yeah, this and this, these decisions I made, you know, they probably weren't the Lord's will. The Lord's faithfulness doesn't change. Whether, you know, whether we're in a place because of our own mistakes or because we follow God's will or often a bit of a mix, <laughs> the Lord's faithfulness is still there, that we can still trust him. That in his plan for us, he's accounted for. <laughs> he's accounted for the fact that um, he's accounted for our own humanity. He's uh, accounted for our own sinfulness. He's accounted for the other things that are beyond our control. Our family, our friends, our relative, the economic situation. All of these things have been accounted for in God's plan. And so that, combined with his faithfulness, means that we can stay in this place of hope even if, or I would dare say, especially if the way forward is not clear. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you are so good. And we thank you for the great plans that you have for us. Plans to be filled in this life and perhaps others after this life. We thank you, Lord, for this. Lord, we cannot see the way forward. And we know that some of the reasons why we're in our current place maybe is because of our own mistakes, our own humanity. But Father, we would just pray that you would restore our hope. That despite what we see on the outside and our personal circumstances, there would be a new rainbow within. A tremendous source of hope. A new sense for your goodness and your commitment to us. So come now and encourage us, Lord, by sending us the Holy Spirit anew. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are so grateful for you, our viewers, and so many of you have been so faithful to stand with us in prayer and in your financial gifts each month or occasionally as you're able to. We're very grateful. Food for Life is not a ministry that is supported by any one organization. We depend on a, the collective efforts of many, many people. And if you feel that Food for Life has been a blessing to you, and if you haven't supported the program financially, and if you're able to, we'd ask you to prayerfully consider doing so. You know, sometimes people don't want to write in because they can't, you know, send in what may be their consideration of a large enough gift. But I want to tell you this, that no gift is too small. Every gift that comes our way, we appreciate, we give thanks for, and it helps to keep Food for Life on the air, that we might be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. If you feel so led to support Food for Life, we'd ask you to write to us. We'd like to hear from you. Please write to us today. You can watch this episode of Food for Life or previous editions 24-7 anywhere around the world on YouTube. Just visit our website, foodforlifetvministry.org, and click on Watch Now on YouTube. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax-deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. We ask you to consider a regular monthly donation, either by post-dated checks or through our website, to help us continue the Food for Life ministry. If you have never donated before, we ask you make your check payable to Food for Life. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at Heart to Heart with God. We sleep better at night when we make peace with God before we go to bed. You know, you go to bed, before you go to bed, have a heart to heart with God and you will sleep so much better. Unburden yourself. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.